When dealing with a falsehood, you're faced with two options. You can accept it or you can reject it. The basis upon which we take one of these actions is a product of our critical thinking capabilities and a desire to know what is true instead of confirming our bias. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. On Brainstorm, we choose the hard truths over the comforting lies. Reason, compassion, skepticism, this is the Brainstorm Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Brainstorm Podcast Skeptic Studio, the interview portion of the Brainstorm Podcast, where we talk to a variety of folks with the intent to spread critical thinking, compassion, and skepticism. I'm Corey, and my panel tonight are Lisa. Hello. 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 <laughs> Sarah. Hello. Angela. Hello. 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 And of course, the always amazing Dave doing sound. Uh, I'm the amazing one, but Google Chrome is, you know, <laughs> it's not, messing with us. It's not doing its thing right. So, you know, Aaron Rabbi started it. Did you notice this in the intro? He, he echoes too. A bit. <laughs> I he didn't does. even notice. Yeah, that's, that's an effect that I, that I put on him. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure I know whose fault all the echo is. Dave, I, I, I chose Dave, to put Dave, that effect Dave. though. I, I, you know, not, I'm not choosing it at this moment. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways, we're here in Roman Empire Studios in Regina, Saskatchewan, and today is January 18th, 2019. Tonight's guest is James Fell, writer for a number of publications, um, blogger at bodyforwife.com, and now author of The Holy Shit Moment. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. All those names that I probably won't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> no, it's just there's so many of them. This is the most people I've had on one podcast. So I'm yeah, you, terrible with names. We actually uh, often I, have. I remember Corey. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We often have like a, a table full as well as uh, Dave and then a guest. So this is, we're actually short people yeah, this time. <laughs> people are sick like, right now. Like, I mean, if it, I hadn't known that I should come and not abandon you guys, like I'm feeling kind of under the weather. And so mm -hmm. it's just sort of that time of year. Where yeah. Get your sure. flu shot. I have a Done. flu shot. It's just That's good. it doesn't defend against the cold. And, yeah. We just have every children. bug manageable right now. In and it's freaking minus 25, which honestly is not even bad for January, but still. Yeah, yeah. it's bad enough. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I guess to start off the interview, uh, I guess I'm curious what got you started writing in the first place? Um, a, a lot of history papers. I guess I did a bachelor's and a master's degree in history, and uh, that was sort of where the, the the skill developed and the passion awakened. And then I later did an MBA and just found that my ability as a writer was really good for my career. But then by the age of forty, I realized that uh, that you know I was I had a successful business career, but I didn't really love it, and realized that life was too short to spend you know most of my waking hours doing something that I wasn't super passionate about. And fortunately, I was married to a doctor, so that allowed me to take the risk to uh, to take a stab at being a writer. And as it turned out, I guess I was kind of good at it because a year after my first piece was published, I had a column with the Los Angeles Times. Jeez, that is pretty good. Yeah. Not too shabby. <laughs> Especially for a Canadian, too. Hey, it's probably a little yeah, tougher so to I was, break I was, the yeah, I was their fitness columnist, and it's not like there was any short, shortage of fitness people down in L.A., yeah. but they, they were letting their some Canadian guy be their, their fitness dude. So. so there's maybe lots of fitness people, but not with the writing prowess that you have? Is that what you're Not, not go ones with? that could string sentences together yeah. as well, I guess. <laughs> I lift things good. <laughs> I think it was the uh, it was the humor. I really just hit it off with yeah. the health editor. I sent her some samples, and she just thought that they were really funny. And and so we we hit it off. And she doesn't work there anymore, but we're still good friends. I actually mention her name in the book. There's a part I think it's around I don't know chapter eight or something where I say hi Rosie. That's the uh, former health editor of the Los Angeles Times. Nice, cool. So that's how you got writing. But how do you go from like a history dude to a fitness guy? I got fat. 
So, How do you go from fat guy was, to fitness guy? That's actually the better question. Well, with a holy shit moment, of course. Yeah, so that was, yeah. um, uh, you know, I, I watched my mother try and fail at losing weight many times. And she tried every commercially marketed gimmick that there was. And I just, you know, I did it based on common sense. It's like, okay, uh, how did I get to be overweight? Um, I drank too much. I ate too much garbage and I never exercised. So what if I did the opposite of that where I, you know, I was uh, starting grad school and uh, had free access to a really nice gym at my university. And so I just started going to the gym all the time and uh, ate less fast food, tried to eat, you know, some green food and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, like and didn't drink Skittles? so much. Uh, yeah, not the, the, I was tasting the rainbow that was not the Skittles variety. And, uh, and you know, drank less booze and w over the next year lost about 50 pounds of fat and put on 20 pounds of muscle. And it just became a really passionate hobby of mine where, you know, I, I read a bunch of books and I talked to people about it. And uh, and I just, the, the more I looked into it, the more I realized just how much a bullshit filled industry it was. And I would talk to friends and, and I would see guys that were, that were into the bullshit. And then other ones, we would talk about how much bullshit was out there. And it was just, it was just one of those things like that, that sort of irked me. And so I knew that when I started writing about health and fitness, that, that I was going to be the, the brutally honest guy that, that exposed all the bullshit. And that was, that was what I became. So how, like at the time, did you know that stuff was bullshit though? Cause so many people, especially in the fitness industry, buy into it and believe it and sell it because, you know, they, it works. And like you go on paleo and you lose weight, so it must work kind of thing. Like how did you wade through the nonsense to know what the science was? Um, I, you know, that's a good question. It, like it, it was a long process. I mean, I started getting in shape at the age of 25 and, uh, and I didn't start writing about it until I was 40. So it was right, 15 yeah. years of just, you know, bits and pieces of information and being more skeptical and, and just... You know, there were there were things about uh, everyone was doing the Body for Life program, which was, you know, uh, basically a decent program. It's by today's standards, it was actually great because, uh, you know, it was telling people to exercise and telling people to eat well. And there was there was some some fibbery in there about m metabolism myths and stuff like that. And that was where I, you know, they were talking about all these popular metabolism myths about um, actually, I think that the first big one was how if you for every pound of muscle that you gained, you would you would um, burn 50 calories a day just doing nothing. I remember and, that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that was a really popular one. And everybody back around the turn of the century was, was parroting that one. And I was doing the math and I went, okay, well, I've gained about 20 pounds of muscle. That's an extra thousand calories a day. That I don't have doing, to move at all. That, that I have to worry about. It's just, <laughs> it's just burning it for me. Woohoo. And I did the math and I went, that is not happening at all. <laughs> like this is just Can't not, right. not even close. So I started reading some more critical books and uh, got into the work of Claude Bouchard, who works at the uh, Pennington lab down in um, Louisiana and, uh, and yeah, it was, it wasn't even close to that. And once I thought, well, if that one's not true, how many of these other ones are true? Like the whole thing about high intensity interval training, have a mega, mega caloric afterburn yeah. effect. And that was a column for the LA times where I blew that one apart. Cause it was bullshit. That one still and, sells pretty good uh, too. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, interval training is still, still a really big one. The reason I do interval training is because, uh, in order to get faster, get better, like it's, it's, it is a performance based exercise. It's not something that you do for fat loss. It can be part of an overall fat loss program, but it's not some miracle weight loss activity. So yeah, that was just, it, it just sort of evolved over time that way. So I'll admit I haven't been able to get very far in the book because we got the weird thing I had to get it on my phone and that took me a while. Um, but the, <laughs> where I've gotten to so far and what I found, because reading at the beginning, I'm kind of like, yeah, sure, everybody can have a holy shit moment. And like, I trust James. I read a lot of his stuff. <laughs> like, he's a smart guy, I'm sure. But I was just very skeptical because I'm very skeptical of everything. And then um, kind of when you were talking about how ego depletion 
isn't a thing. And I'm like, it's totally a thing because like I get sick of doing stuff and then I just stop doing it. Uh, and then the part where it's like the studies have shown that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe that <laughs> you only have so much willpower, then you will only have so much willpower. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. that's me to a T. So <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> All right. there's some interesting stuff in there about uh-huh. how um, people can feel that ego depleted where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm completely drained of my willpower for a day. And then something can change it in an instant mm-hmm. that you can get a phone call that brightens up your day or, um, you know, a, a, some type of distraction. Somebody tells a good joke. It can change so quickly that it throws it all out that, that you know, even prayer can do it or, or a short little TV break or, or anything uh, getting into me- meditation. It just changes so fast. It has um, willpower is not this limited resource. It's one of it's it's based on our internal drivers. People will work themselves to absolute exhaustion, you know, the whole, the, the whole Brian Adams played the guitar till your fingers bled because right. you, you had a rage to master that you, it, there was no, the challenge was making yourself stop because you had so much overwhelming internal drive to do it, that you would do it that you, co- until you collapsed from exhaustion. So your physical, the physical body can give out long before the psychological drive to do it does. And I guess I always just assumed that that was just like certain people just had more like drive and ability to do stuff. And I just wasn't one of those people. Right. So it's uh, this book has been good and starting to open my mind a bit. So I'm looking forward to continuing for sure. Yeah, it's and the thing is that, that yeah, there there are people who have really strong global motivation that kind of piss me off. And yeah, like right. Just like, <laughs> but, I'm gonna be good at but, everything and take and, on twenty million hobbies. And it's like fuck yeah. off, just, just and they that. Uh, but then there there's people that that you know they they find something that individually they're they have a, a focal type of motivation where this is my thing and I'm just gonna do it gangbusters like i know people that are super hardcore about housework their house is always yeah. perfectly organized and immaculate and they like, iron I, their tea towels i have shit. no motivation to do that yeah. i hate that kind of shit yeah. like my my bathroom gets pretty nasty before i go in there with the scrub brush and whereas you know other people think oh writing like oh how can you do that i just uh, it's ew, gross that's just terrible it's i want i want multiple choice exams and i'm like no i want essay format exams yeah. <laughs> and so it, it depends on what you're individually passionate about and and for me like uh, you know i'll go out running in minus 30 because i think it's i think it's cool and that's it's the best both time a, to run. <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> there's nobody else out there you're both nuts. <laughs> but it, it's uh you know, it just depends what, what we're individually interested in. And, and that's, you know, the whole premise of the book is having one of those lightning strike moments that awakens that passion in an instant because we've been taught that, you know, slow and steady is the way to yeah. behavior change. And especially with things like using weight loss as an example. And the problem with that is that, you know, the, the whole be a tortoise, not a hare is that it's focused on behavior change. And when you when you focus strictly on your uh, your behaviors, then you're doing battle with those more internal core drivers that aren't in line with that. And it's based on um, social psychologist Milton Rokic's model of personality, which is, you know, ogres are like onions, well, so are people. Mm-hmm. And that external layer of personality is just the stuff that we do, our actions, our behaviors, whatever. You go down a layer and then you've got your uh, beliefs and then it's attitudes is a layer deeper and then you get into the really powerful ones your values and your core identity the the self and um when you struggle to change behavior and you try to change too much too fast like you know you show up at uh, hung over as hell with a blood alcohol concentration that would tranquilize Charlie Sheen <laughs> on January 1st for a session with Attila, tra- Attila the trainer in the gym, the same time you're quitting smoking, quitting drinking, and yeah. uh, and eating all your fruits and veg- vegetables. That's a recipe for crash and burn if, if you are um, unmotivated to do it, if you're just focusing on the behavior change. Conversely, if someone's had some type of 
uh, transformative experience that says, okay, this is happening now. I'm just going to do this because it's who I am now. Then, yeah, you still need to sort of adopt. You don't want to wreck yourself in the gym. You need to adopt exercise behaviors at a rational pace. But um, but motivation is no longer a scarce resource because the behaviors sync up with those internal drivers. But the, the whole the whole baby steps approach is logical if behavior change is all you care about because you know you're talking about dragging yourself over a motivational tipping point and and um, you know slowly developing those habits that become sticky in the instance of you know, having a holy shit moment, you don't even have to worry about that kind of crap. If you have this life-changing epiphany, you just change and it's pretty much effortless. And there's plenty of examples of, of people in the book that include weight loss and becoming ultra marathoners where it's just like, yep, this is happening. And they never had to worry about being motivated again. Okay. So how well, do you do I that? Really like what you had to say about the, the, oh, sorry. The people, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. A little quiet. Uh, the, the thing you had to say about people who had those those light bulb moments, those holy shit moments about uh, how they quit stuff, cold turkey, like quitting smoking and stuff like that. Yes. Um, it, it's very common in battling addiction and generally more powerful. So the people, yeah. so the research into smokers, thousands of smokers have been looked at. The ones that had a triggering event that led to an immediate renunciation of cigarettes were more successful and they usually didn't even need pharmacotherapy. They didn't need a nicotine wow. patch. They were just done. And there's yeah. a good, there's a story in the book of, okay, so what does that look like? What does a triggering event to quit smoking look like? Well, there's an example in the book that um, of a man that went to pick up his kids from the library and it was raining out. And he wanted a cigarette. So he starts, you know, looking through his pockets and looking in the glove compartment and even under the seat of the car, couldn't find any. So he starts to drive off to the store to get some. And as he pulls away from the curb, he spies in the rearview mirror his kids coming out of the library. And what pops into his head is, I think I can get to the store and back before they get too wet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. dude, no. And and in that instant, he realized what a horrible thought that was. And he just quit smoking immediately wow. because he decided that he didn't want to be the type of man that would leave his kids standing in the rain to chase after a drug. Yeah. So that is, that's an identity shift. He, a, a, an identity shift and a, and a shift in values. He was the type of man that would put his children before his addiction. And and that was it. These, that's what those types of things look like. Um, we've also got the example of Chuck Gross, who lost half his body weight. Yeah. Uh, weighed over 400 pounds, tried and failed to lose weight many times. Hated exercising, hating, hated watching what he ate. And uh, then unexpected announcement, wife comes out of the bathroom with a positive pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. And that's an identity change. He went from not a father to congratulations, dude, you're going to be a dad. That's father is a powerful identity for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and so that was a rapid identity shift as well as a shift in values where he really, what was valuable to him was being a fit dad. And in that instant, he said, it was like a strike of lightning where I knew this time it was going to work. Here's a direct quote from Chuck. This man that weighed 410 pounds, he said, I didn't have to struggle with my motivation. It came built in. And I think that that is the epitome of what such an experience can look like, that, that it, he just knew that it was going to happen. And he was right. He didn't have to struggle. He lost over 200 pounds. He's kept it off more than a decade, which... Losing 200 pounds without weight loss surgery and keeping yeah. it off for that long, that's extraordinarily rare. And yeah. have it feel like it, it's where you still have to do all the work associated with it. It's not, it's not miracle, you know, right. weight loss, lose weight fast, lose weight easy, kind of, you know, cover of Women's World magazine kind of crap. <laughs> um, it, it's still a tremendous amount of work. The fundamental shift, which is something that because it's such an emotionally powerful experience happens very quickly with a massive insight is that what once felt like either of no interest or felt like drudgery has now suddenly become your destiny 
that must be fulfilled. You don't have a choice. You're compelled. There's a quote from Steve Jobs. You don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. That's what this is. You're being pulled by a new vision that is suddenly unveiled. Mm-hmm. So, and I mean, it's it sounds kind of airy-fairy <laughs> in some ways, but the reality is this happens. Like we have myriad examples of this happening to millions of people all the time that, okay, so if people are having these transformative experiences, why? How does it happen? Like, and can we make it happen for ourselves? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm pretty clear in the book that, okay, here's all sort kinds of things that you can do that increase the likelihood of, that it's going to happen, but there's no guarantees. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's like, good luck. We think it might happen. The harder you work, the more likely it gets, but you know, it's, it's, it's not like a blueprint for building a house. <laughs> yeah, but I think, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, the more you want it and the more you do that sort of stuff, because if that kind of transformative change is because, you know, your values have changed and your identity has changed, if you're kind of working on your values and your identity, it, won't it kind of happen automatically anyway, even well, if it's not I mean, necessarily a, a holy shit moment? That, that's the, You'll get like uh, halfway there at least. So it'll be like well, there, a little easier to go to the gym then <laughs> if you're yeah, just there, like, fine, I'll lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, what, what I say is that, that, okay, even if you never have one as a result of reading this book, you're still going to be better off. I yeah. mean, the, the, the tasks that I give people are still valuable. And another thing is I don't completely throw out the baby steps approach because if you consider motivation like a mountain, and zero motivation to do anything toward a certain goal is the base of the mountain. And the peak of the mountain is absolute, total 100% motivation to do all of the work with inspired vigor. Um, if you're at the base of the mountain, you don't just hang out there and wait <laughs> for, for it to come and pick you up and transport you to the top. Um, that happens sometimes. That's what happened with, with Chuck, who lost half his body weight. Um, but... If if the goal has been identified and you think I'd really like to do this thing, then you need to start taking those, start hiking up that mountain via slow and steady, you know, baby steps, the traditional behavior change model in a sustainable habit forming fashion. And then, but while you're doing that, so you're doing this tortoise approach, but you're thinking like a hare, you're engaging in mindfulness practice and uh, information gathering and analysis and distraction where you open your mind to the transformative experience where suddenly you have what is called a sudden gain in motivation. You may not be taken all the way to the top of Motivation Mountain, but you can be transported much further up it. And there's examples in, in the book, in the introduction, Leslie, the fencer, she struggled for two months and then suddenly had that moment where she decided, I'm going to get as good at this as I possibly can. And 10 years later, she won a silver medal at the, the Canadian American uh, Games. And, you know, for me, I had my experience in university that, that changed me a whole bunch, but not on the fitness side. It was two years later, two or three years later, when um, I decided, okay, I'm fat, I need to get in shape. I had a good work ethic and I forced myself to go to the gym and it was a couple of months of drudgery until there was another one of those clarifying epiphanies that suddenly I went, yep, okay, this used to completely suck. Now it doesn't totally suck. And if I could go from to something not totally sucking, then eventually I can learn to love it. So I'm going to keep doing this until I'm dead. And that was 25 years ago. So still going pretty good, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, if you're running in minus 30, I'd say you've got it figured out. Don't you think so much of this is kind of establishing a new baseline? You know what I mean? Like a new, you're, bu- you're, you're buying into something different. Like like for me, I, about a year ago, I started running three or four times a week regularly. And I had been running in the past, but never consistently. And now I just, I'm just like, All right, that's just what I do. I run, I run at lunchtime at work three or four, when yeah. I can, which ends up being three or four times a week. That's just what I do. And I don't, I don't question it. It's like brushing my teeth. I don't go in the morning. Like, oh, I really should brush my teeth. My dentist says I, ha-, you know, I, I agonize yeah, it over just, every fucking day. I just, I just do it. And the same thing with well, exercise. I just, 
I mean, we, we are evolving, we are changing in terms of our identity and our values all the time anyway. And it, they are things that can happen gradually. Um, but when it goes through a really big shift, it generally, is that it that, that comes because of a sudden insight, mm-hmm. then that's, uh, you know, we, it, it's not, it's not always, sometimes it's quantum where it's, it's a, digital on or off type of thing. And other times it it comes in waves and it can be gradual. Humans are not cookie cutters. We change in all sorts of different ways. And the thing with, with your, your identity is what we're seeing with the examples in the book are the people that did have it happen rapidly and effortlessly. But I, you need to be careful with the word effortlessly is because, okay, yes, suddenly you are overwhelmingly motivated to do this thing, but then it can also kind of come to rule your life where it's like, it's going to keep you awake when you should sleep. (laughs) So, so effortless or easy or not, not words that really apply (laughs) that way. (laughs) Cause you know, when you suddenly have this maddening quest that you just say, this has got to happen, I got to do it or I'm going to die. That was like, I, you know, when I decided to, um, become a writer. I'd never worked so hard at anything in my life. Like the, you know, I was making more money as a marketing executive, but I wasn't inspired. When I finally was getting published and had a column with the LA Times, I was like, that first time I was published in the Los Angeles Times, I was like, oh yeah, like that was such a big reinforcement of, of the vision that, um, I don't know if you've read chapter four yet, but there's a lot of neuroscience in chapter four about the, um, the neuromodulators that, yeah. that cause this um, phenomenon to work. And it's that ongoing role of dopamine that, that recognizes progress via incentive reward of every little time that you do so, that you make a step in the right direction, you get another kick in the ass that just keeps you going. And that's what motivates people to stick with it. Uh, month after month and year after year is just seeing any type of progress that uh, that keeps you on the path. Even a little bit, the example that I used in the book was if somebody goes back to school, uh, their, their sudden epiphany is, I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to finish my degree. They go online and they look at courses. That takes, you know, 10 minutes, doesn't take a tremendous amount of effort, but it gives them a little drip of dopamine that says, yep, that was the right thing to do. Good job. Keep going. And then they they register for courses. Another drip of pleasurable, not good feeling drip of dopamine. Yeah, you're doing it right on. Go you. They go to class. They study. They take tests. Every single little effort is a drip of dopamine that keeps them pursuing that path. Because that's the problem that we see with so many people that try change that's uninspired is they um, the lack of adherence. It's like, oh, I want to get in shape. I want to lose weight. I want to, you know, um, learn to play an instrument or whatever. If if they're not dedicated to the goal to the point where the incentive reward is going to have value for them, then they're not going to feel it. They're not going to experience that, you know, neurochemical positive rush. And it's just not going to work. But when you have that powerful transformative experience, there's that big initial blast of dopamine along with opioids that just feels really wonderful that you're like, hell yes. And the um, it's, it's like the, you know, opera conditioning, positive reinforcement of the, the ongoing progress that you experience makes you want to relive that epiphany again and again, that it just, it, it unleashes this quest mentality that will not be denied. I love that. <laughs> Little Angela's voice is like, I love that. <laughs> Pep talk. <laughs> some of some of the lines in your in your book I have to I have to read a couple. The the brilliant line of the semi sentient stardust meat sacks. And it's pretty um, I place honesty over that of wealth, which is why I haven't packaged my neighbor's dog shit into gelatin capsules to sell over the internet as an all natural miracle weight loss appetite suppressant. <laughs> That's I mean, yeah, I've got a, I've got a way with words sometimes, I guess. <laughs> and it's it's kind of delightful in that it combines science with 
those little those little nuggets yeah. in there, and it's just it's a very entertaining read for sure. Yeah, yeah as, well, those those is, were the type of lines that got me in the L.A. Times. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, yeah. Anything I've read, like I love reading any of your stuff on MRAs and stuff because you just there's so much fodder there and you have just oh, the perfect way those guys. <laughs> right like just they sucks fun. actually um i i diss them in i think it's chapter eight because oh, I um I, I wrote uh, i wrote a piece just a couple of days ago called you can't please everyone don't even try and i talk about the um the fact that that with this book uh you know i have very strong opinions about social justice and I am pro-feminism, and I think men's rights activists are douchebags. And I think if you're pissed off at that Gillette commercial, you need to just <laughs> go away and fuck off and then fuck off some more. Um, <laughs> and and so when I wrote this book, it's it's like, you know what? I'm not hiding who I am. This is I have I have a voice and I have certain values that I want to put forward. So the book is very progressive in its thinking where there is a strong pro-feminism message. Uh, I interviewed Catherine Switzer, who was the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon in 1967 and was was responsible for getting the Olymp- the women's marathon in the Olympic Games in 1984. So that was uh, a very strong message about women's empowerment regarding running. And I mean, she's a feminist icon. In chapter four, there's uh, an interview with a woman who had a sudden epiphany about her gender identity. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then in chapter eight, there's like a whole bunch of stuff about how women have a tendency to sacrifice their own dreams for the care of others. Yeah. And there's, you know, been research done into this. This is, you know, we all know it to be true, but there's been research into it. And there's, you know, quotes from Maya Angelou and, and Rosa Parks and uh, Malala Yousafzai and, and all that kind of stuff about the, and, and in there I talked about, uh, I can't remember the context of it, but I talked about my my article for Time magazine like five years ago where I ripped the shit out of men's rights activists and and that it went viral and they talked about it on CNN television. So it's just a little dig in there. And I said, I hate those guys. (laughs) So so, uh, and uh, the the opening line of this article a couple days ago where I where I was talking about um, about why I decided to put this type of of messaging in my book. The opening line is, um, I said to my agent, uh, I don't think Trump voters are going to like this book. And <laughs> his reply was, okay. his reply was, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know you're with the right people too then, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that was like, was the message. You can't please everyone. So I, I wrote this book for the type of people that read my stuff and appreciate it anyway. Yeah. That, you know, there's big words, there's lots of science. Your typical Trump voter's not going to get it anyway. Yeah. So fuck them. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. And I think, yeah, one of my like favorite things about you is that you, I mean, this is going to sound really weird, but I hope you get what I mean is that you are a white male <laughs> who's like a buff guy who's saying all of these things because, you know, when I say it as a woman or anybody else says, you know, this is how women are treated, this is what happens if we say no to somebody, like all that sort of thing. Well, Nobody I'm sorry, really... there was a woman talking. I stopped listening. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, exactly. So it's like you're kind of the perfect, uh, you know, you're the the model for feminism because, okay, he's white, He's great a dude. power, great responsibility. Like, all that kind yeah, of stuff. well, but like people will listen to you. So, you know, you, you have kind of triple the voice that some of us do. So I'm so, so glad that you're using it for such good things, yes. right? Because, I, you know, this Gillette ad has just, you know, there's a lot of men that are like, wow, I can't believe how butt hurt some dudes are. Like, I thought you're supposed to be tough and yet you're freaking out over this. Yeah, and it's, And it's like... This is, I'm just like, yeah, now you guys are all seeing what we've been seeing like our whole lives. I think, there's guys I think the, like the like. term that I used, it's called Lewis's law that any, um, and it refers to an article, but it's, it applies. It's any article of the comments on any article about feminism yeah. prove the need for feminism yeah. Yeah. is yeah. the way I think it goes. And that's, this is exactly what took place there. And yeah, it just, 
you look at these people and I think, what the hell is wrong with you? And where, where a lot of it came from, like I, I a very strong-minded, strong-willed, successful mother. She's the one I dedicated the book to. And, uh, and so I had that influence in my life and I watched her blow through glass ceilings in a male dominated industry. And and she just took no shit from anybody, but she also was successful because she just worked so damn hard and was so incredibly smart. And then, um, but what really got me to start thinking about how I needed to use my voice for this kind of thing was, listening to my wife on conference calls and Uh, we would be, um, so my wife often works from home and she would do these conference calls and, uh, and I would be listening to her and just, my, my wife is brilliant. She, you know, straight A student and, and, uh, graduated top of her class from medical school. And, and she's doing these, these conference calls with, with these people where, where I can see that, you know, she would have convinced me ages ago, but she kept having to to push to get her way in what she knew was the right way to do things. And it reminded me of, you know, when I was back in the boardroom with my white male MBA talking that I would just say, oh, yeah, you know, maybe we should do it this. And everyone says, yes, we should do it here, that here. way because yeah. the white male with the MBA said we should. And it was like it was like it was it was easy to get my yeah. way. And then listening to my wife, she had to fight so hard all the time. And she was always like, she was so brilliant. In 29 years together, I think I've won maybe two and a half arguments. And Uh because she's just so good. (laughs) You have no chance, yeah. At, at, you know, you finally walk out of an argument thinking, yeah, I guess I really was the asshole there. (laughs) And and the, the fact that it took her so long to convince these men that, that, this was the right way to do things. It made me think they're just not respecting her because she was a woman. Yeah. If she had a, if she was a man, she could have done it in a third of the time. And that was one of the things that prompted me. Well, I mean, my breaking point was the Elliot Roger massacre with the whole incel bullshit because yeah. of the um, uh, being writing in fitness. There was all that crap about the alpha male that just made me want to barf, and I never, I never said anything about it. But then with the Elliot Roger massacre in 2014, that was, and his whole desire to be an alpha male who got all the sex, I was like, fuck this, I'm writing this article. And um, and then that changed everything. But yeah, the stuff about my, um, that was when I went anti-alpha male, anti-MRA. And then when I started, you know, understanding more about just how people don't have much respect for women was listening to my wife on the phone. Well, yeah, it's good you kind of had a real world example of somebody you respected that you could plainly see wasn't being listened to. Um, Because, yeah, it's just so many times you'll say that like, oh, they're not listening to me because I'm a chick or they, you know, they talk over me or whatever else. And like, well, no, maybe it was just because of this or that or whatever. It's like, no, straight up just because I'm a chick. (laughs) Yeah, she didn't even seem to notice it that much. Like she didn't (laughs) think it was that bad and i said yeah, just i was the one that convinced her like oh yeah you have to work so much harder like i told her about you know my boardroom experiences um that it was just so easy to get my way and i wasn't half as smart as she was or i didn't work as hard my arguments weren't as, weren't nearly as good and people were like oh yeah let's do it that way and it, it and so i had to convince her like like no they should you should have convinced them like half an hour ago. <laughs> it's their their obstinance because of your gender is what I what I think is going on here. And it wasn't just you know a couple of phone calls with the same people. This this is over many many dozens of phone calls with yeah. different groups of people. Yeah, so as this outside objective observer, it it was a slow realization for me. And so it was just it was it was interesting to to watch because i had no stake in these conversations um you know i was just couldn't help but over here cuz my wife's pretty loud <laughs> when she's on the phone <laughs> and so i just sort of and i wasn't i wasn't listening to them you know looking for a problem to identify i just noticed it over time it just started to sink in and yeah. i finally said 
that shit ain't right. Yeah. <laughs> so. so as someone, I know we got to wrap up soon, but as somebody who's kind of got their finger on the pulse of whole MRA and cell bullshit, do you think with, you know, everything that's going on lately that it's going to get worse before it gets better or is it just going to get worse or is it going to get better? You know, that's a really good question. And I'm not sure I have an accurate answer. I mean, there, there's there's lots of different ways to look at it. The, when, when we look at um, society as a whole, um, climate change notwithstanding, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that it seems like the world's getting better, even though, you know, currently Trump is in power. But the assholes are getting um, louder and I worry that yeah, they, and you know, I mean, you maybe, get more of a maybe it's the last louder, right? dying gasp. I mean, I think that yeah. we're gradually moving toward a post-spiritual age in a lot of ways. And, and, but the thing is that religion has been used as a source of power for a very long time and they're yeah, going to go down fighting. Yeah. So, um, and a lot, and not only that, but, but we hear about it more now because everybody has a voice The you know, the internet and, and the constant news cycle. And it used to be that people watched the news for 30 minutes a day at six o'clock. Yeah. And, and that was it. Whereas now we're constantly plugged in, but, you know, I heard an analogy that, you know, today's, Republican Party is, um, what is it, further left than the Democrat Party of the 50s. That's and, terrifying. And when you think about it, that, that you know, in looking at in the 50s or watching, you know, Mad Men in the 60s, yeah, I suppose, um, yeah. which I asked my mom, I said, was it really like that in the 60s? And she goes, it was exactly oh, like no. that. <laughs> so she worked in an office environment and she said, oh yeah, that's the way women were treated. That was exactly the way it was. So you see the way that, you know, the improvements that have been made. I was born in 1968 that, that you know, since I was born and, um, civil rights and gay marriage. And, and there's a lot of things to be happy about, about the, the direction that the world is moving. But there's so many fucking douchebags that just don't want to let it go. And they're going to go down fighting, but the world is going to leave them behind. And, and you look at the next generation, like people are always pissing on millennials and the younger generation. I think they're awesome. Yeah. When I was, and I should give a shit I, about human rights yeah. and stuff. I was, I was a teen in the eighties and I am ashamed of the things that we said and the, the attitudes that we had towards um, gay people as an example. You know, that was the height of the AIDS epidemic. And um, like, I remember, and now excuse me for saying this, this is, I'm saying this just so people understand how bad it was. Um, but I remember someone wearing a hat at school that there was, there was an old ad for the, the insecticide company uh, that said, Raid kills bugs dead. That was their tagline in the 80s. I saw somebody wearing a hat that said AIDS kills fags dead. Oh, okay. And that and that was oh, people he wore it to school. Yeah, nobody and said anything. Yeah. Nobody said anything. Like people laughed and thought it was cool. That was wow. that was the 80s. And it's and heartless. I, hey? yeah. I know. And like that things have changed. Yeah. And that's yeah. good. Now and I mean I was I was interviewed for uh uh well not interviewed but uh, when my first book came out five years ago, Canadian Living was asking for prominent Canadian authors of their their proudest moment as a Canadian. And I didn't hesitate. I said, when gay marriage was legalized. Because to me, that was, we were the fourth country in the world and the yeah. first Western yeah. democracy, uh, or the first Western hemisphere uh, country to, to do it. Um, and uh, and for me, that was the defining moment of what it meant to be Canadian was, you know, we did it 10 years before the United States did yeah. that. And it was nationwide and it was just a done deal. And I, and I was like, hell yeah, that's that to me was the epitome of, of what our country is capable of. So, yeah, I, I think that that you've got the assholes that just don't like it and they're going to be loud and they're, you know, screeching pterodactyl noises and all that kind of crap that that. We just got to keep pushing forward and leave these losers behind. And, uh, and you know, there's, uh, they're, they're always going to exist, but the majority hopefully is going to stay on the path that, that we've continued to be on. I mean, I think about 100 years ago, you weren't allowed to not go to church. Like, you were a yeah. freaking outcast. Yeah. And 
now it's like I look at most people. It's like people say, "Oh yeah, I go to church every Sunday." It's almost like well, you do. That's kind of yeah. weird. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> I mean, in Canada, Why? It's kind of weird. don't you have something yeah. better to do with your Sunday? <laughs> yeah, it's in in Canada, it, it seems kind of weird. And, yeah, and in small yeah. town, you know, Bible Belt, United States, it's like yeah, yeah if you sure. don't go to church, you're an outcast. But, you know, you go to the city, you get to live the way you want. You get to be who you want to be and you know, go to church if you want. You don't have to. Um, you know, you can um, you can be gay and you can be the uh, the gender that you feel like you were born with. And I mean, there's still oppression, but but I see it getting better. Let's all hope so. <laughs> yeah. I am hopeful, although yeah, I think we may, just, yeah, we may somebody, all die yeah. in a literal fucking fire from climate change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so that'll be the next question is like, will we die before that from climate change or will we actually get to see a time when, you know, in, incels don't exist anymore and no longer are on the internet and no longer recruiting other jackwads? Well, I and that y- a, the, it's, it's all sort of moves as a, a scale, right? Like the, um, th- there may be, you know, 50 years from now, I'm sure there's going to people that think that we're Neanderthals, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> true. So. Uh, yeah, I would love to know what the next thing is, like what the thing that we're doing that's just so ass backwards to the future. Animals, maybe? Yeah, I know a lot of people like... How we treat that, yeah. livestock. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the way we do animal, yeah, animal food. I, I still and- like steak and bacon too much yeah but let's say technology gets good enough that uh lab grown meat meat tastes just exactly the same and it's cheaper i I wrote an article about that that, right (laughs) and then and then in 50 years it'll be like you did what to cows you 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 raise them how you raise chickens how they were you know they were in what conditions and they suffered how and that's ridiculous you know what i mean you had to kill them to eat them (laughs) what Well, yeah, it's not I so know, much the I, killing is how they're treated when they're yeah, how true, they suffer yeah. when they're alive. But like in order to get meat, you had to yeah. like raise and kill for the purpose of yeah, killing. I wrote it an article first. last year. Um, I tried the A and W Beyond Meat Burger, and it was good. And yeah. I, I wrote an article titled "One Day We Will All Be Vegan." And not because we've decided to do it, but just because, you know, I don't know how long it'll take. But eventually, I believe that technology will get to the point that they will be able to create um, meat-like products that are indistinguishable from meat. Well, and even just like actual meat that's just grown in a lab instead of... It could be lab-grown, it could be plant-grown, but it it will not involve... Yeah, like that unbelievable burger, I think. Well, and there's also the... um, the inevitable uh, replicator technology. Right, right. <laughs> is, is that really going to happen? Yes. Gee, <laughs> <laughs> Earl Grey. Watching Hot. too much Star Trek. Done. Done. <laughs> Speaking of which, my wife wants me to go watch Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> <laughs> that, was well, that sounds good. <laughs> I, uh, generally, when we have an author on, I say that I will buy a copy of the book for the first person who emails us. So I will do that again. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and thanks for joining us. I guess we'll uh, go to our break. And I'll, I'll just say, if, if everyone, if anyone is thinking about um, buying the book, the easiest way to find it is to go to my site, bodyforwife.com, and there's a, a books tab, and there's every possible link to buy it, uh, including audio. I did the narration for it. Oh, nice! Oh, sweet. Do you get paid if we buy the book through your site? Um, more than if you I just think I've got a, uh, I, the the Amazon affiliate link got denied for some stupid reason. Oh. So technically, no, <laughs> I just did it so to make it easy. So there's, oh. but yeah, there's every whichever platform you want to buy it from. It's just the easiest. Every link is there. The, the every link that I know that exists it can be found at <laughs> bodyforwife.com. dot com. One stop, or you can just walk into a bookstore on Tuesday. Yeah, I was going to say I didn't think it was. Quite yeah, Tuesday. Okay. Tuesday I don't know is launch day. Nice. Perfect. Well, good luck with that. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
If you like what we're doing and want to help us keep the lights on, go become a patron at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. You can hear the bonus half hour that we record every episode and get a shout out when you support the show. Become a patron for just a dollar an episode at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. Or you can support the show by ordering a t-shirt, mug or other gear from our store at cafepress.ca forward slash brainstorm podcast gear. If you can't afford to become a patron or buy gear, then why not give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Stitcher? Every rating makes it easier for people to find us. Thanks for your support. The Atheists, The Bible, and No Wardrobe, The Podcast. Wait a minute. No wardrobe? You mean we're going to be naked while we do this? Well, seeing how I'm an atheist and I'm reading the Bible, and since clothes are flammable... Fire! 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 I thought it might be a good idea to take them all off first. (laughs) Naked or not, follow along as we read, analyze, and try to keep you from falling asleep as we go through this boring-ass book. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker. Who knows? We may even be on YouTube someday. All right, so I guess we'll do some of the closing stuff. Like I oh. got uh, no feedback. December was uh, obviously we didn't do anything in December, so there was no feedback. It was a slow month. It was a slow month. We were all celebrating the glory of the birth of our Lord and Savior, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fucking busy doing that. Sure. That's I mean, Christ and Christmas. I, turkey dinner three t- or like turkey meal three <laughs> times in two days fucking right. amazing that or maybe awesome. you had dreidels and, and potato pancakes maybe. Well, yeah some people I did didn't. maybe hanukkah right oh, yeah i've love, loved potato pancakes <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> no the only thing to do is to celebrate the birth of our lord <laughs> savior jesus christ by going oh, to that really long mat midnight is it oh, that God. isn't that the one that's like the midnight mass i know the easter one's super long yeah yeah my, my mom is like gotta go to every mass possible jeez oh, like why? <laughs> no, I didn't go to any. I'll be honest, I didn't go to any church. I went to a funeral. Oh, I didn't. This I don't anymore. But it wasn't but at a church. It was at a funeral home. Anyways, for my childhood. <laughs> we did get a new patron at the Yay. critical thinker level, Drifa Jones Dotier. Uh, uh, thank you for being our new patron. You rock. Yeah. Yes, they do. Uh, if you want to help the show grow, then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstorm podcast or by sending a one-time payment to paypal.me dot slash brainstorm podcast. Thanks to our top patrons. Destin doesn't suck that much. Daryl Goosen, Aaron Young, William Driver, Positively Skeptical, and the Flying Spaghetti Monster sauce be upon him. Becoming a top patron means you donate at the skeptic level, which is $5 per episode or higher. We have no new reviews, but we're on Podchaser now. So go to Podchaser and review us. Ooh. Podchaser wants to be the IMDb of podcasts. Ah, ah good luck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's so many things going on. But a database of all the podcasts. I mean, that's kind of what Apple Podcasts is. I mean, anybody who has a podcast typically is on Apple Podcasts. Yeah, but yeah. if you yeah. don't have an Apple. I know, but most mm. podcasts broadcast at least on that platform, if not oh, on others. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. And But Podchaser, you can actually look for hosts. If they've been entered into the database, then you can find okay. out what shows they've been on oh. and go through that. Because it's a database. That's right. I get uh, it now. The Internet Movie Database, <laughs> IMDb. This is the podcast database. All right. So that's that. I have nothing to plug, but I do want to say thank you to Dave for being our studio guy, our audio guy for five years. You're welcome. <laughs> it's Thanks, been pretty Dave. awesome. It's actually pretty crazy to think about how... How long it's been? This is yeah, kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. Like we're well, not doing enough for you. Well, I I, I didn't want to make I it. I was clapping. Yeah, I clap. think it's a big deal. I, uh, I, I didn't want to make it a big thing. We're gonna. To it, it's go quietly. Not just because of the audio stuff, but also because of your input. Yeah. It's been very good. Pers- very nice perspective. Very useful yeah. and. So what you're saying well is you needed you needed brown input because you didn't have enough. Well, no, no, just your social. <laughs> Your I social, actually kind of like uh, yeah, more your social work background. Work is yeah. background is really <laughs> helpful. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been uh, 
It's been a long time. Yeah, five yeah. years is uh, uh, pretty pretty long for almost any show. Like we recorded, there's a picture on the wall here, and we recorded <laughs> uh, in my first ever spot. We recorded, so you've been we've been recording this show since I first ever moved to a commercial space, right? So that's yeah, I've been over five years. Oh well, I moved to a commercial space over five years ago. Yeah. So and we did our s- third show in the studio. Yes, that's right. Yeah, you sat around that little squ- rec- or round table in that little glass room. Yeah, you and Mike. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Oh man, that was the yeah, that was the start here. Yep. And and once we did the studio, we knew we could not go back to just sitting around a table and at somebody's house. <laughs> except, we were, except now that we're going except to. Except, except now we have. Well, Cor- Corey has more than a headset mic, though. At yeah, home. That's, that's true. What, I think that's all you use the first time, right? We're, yeah, the, we're considerably more uh, well equipped. Yeah, even without me. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I'll, I mean, who knows where I'll be? What'll happen? But I'll, you know. And maybe we can get you to come out every now and then. Well, even just to chat. If we, yeah, if we don't talk about anything political. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I could come or talk. Or only federal. I could come talk about. Only federal. <laughs> comic federal. books. No, yeah, kidding. come talk about comic books. Batman. <laughs> Batman movies. Comic movies. Yeah. Aquaman. Oh, it was so oh, good, so wasn't good. it good? Pretty fun, yeah. <laughs> oh, it was so, so fucking good. So cheesy and so fun. But yeah. it was just, I mean, comic movies are supposed to be cheesy, oh, yeah. but they're well, entertaining. Not, not all of them, not all of them. And right. I love Jason Momoa. We totally have a bonus content conversation to have. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> got a few. Got a few. Game of Thrones yeah. coming out too. No, Spider Verse. Oh, that was pretty good. Was yeah. Fucking amazing. Yeah, I watched that one. I didn't see that. Oh, it's good. Is that the comic one? Yeah. Oh, or the yeah. cartoon. Oh, yeah. 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 Really interesting. All right. Must see. All right. Let's cue that outro music. The outro music one last time. Here we go. Dun, dun, dun. Comes. All right. For all the things, you can check out the show notes at our, bra- our website, brainstormblog.net. And on our hosting page, thebrainstormpodcast.com. Thanks to our financial supporters, Driffa, Kayla, Kim, Stephanie, Zach, the Utah Outcasts, Will, Aaron, Daryl, Bob Glenn, Dustin Doesn't Suck That Much, Magnus, several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave, Positively Skeptical, Rob, the Podong Polymath, the Flying Spaghetti Monster, Sauce Be Upon Him, Freethinker215, and Larry. I swear, if we ever hit 20... Patrons, I will stop reading all of them. <laughs> what happened to Dustin Sucks? Damn it. <laughs> you can change your name now. <laughs> That's fucking suck. Where the fuck are you, Dustin? <laughs> if you want to join the show grow, then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstorm podcast. Or go buy some stuff at tpublic.com slash store slash brainstorm dash podcast dash gear. This is normally where I would mention the next live show, but we probably won't be live until I figure this shit out. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So, no I'm sorry, worries. Everyone. But we will be posting on Facebook and Twitter to let everybody know what's going on. Big thanks to James Fell for joining us. You can find more of his stuff at bodyforwife.com. So make sure to check that out. Thanks to everybody who came out tonight. And thank you, Dave, for doing the studio thing. Thank you. We love you. It's been a a, a slice. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Thanks for the intro music. Dave, thanks to Aaron Rabbi from Embrace the Void for doing the voiceover. You can find his stuff at voidpod.com. Thanks to Alex Kepper Murdoch for doing the voiceover for our ads. And thanks to Jason Camo for our outro music. You can find his stuff at alloststateofmind.com. All music played is either with permission or under the SoCan license to play. For more information on SoCan, you can check out the music license info page on our website, brainstormblog.net. Make sure to tune in to our brainstormafterhours.com for the bonus content. Remember to give us a rating, a thumbs up, or a fave on your podcatcher of choice. Join our Facebook group, like our page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our subreddit, sign up for our newsletter, share the show, and spread the word. The more you share, comment, and like our stuff, the more it helps the show grow. Thanks for light, listening, and remember, the truth matters.
This is an opinion-based podcast. Each person on the podcast is responsible for their own opinions, and those opinions don't necessarily reflect the views of the rest of the panel. Any guests or anyone associated with the people on the podcast, such as spouses, partners, children, other family members, friends, or employers. No one person speaks for the podcast, with the possible exception of Corey, and he doesn't speak for anyone else on the show. The Brainstorm podcast does not represent the views of our sponsors.